good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to today's API seminar series. Um, I am actually joining you from the nation's capital, so if there's the sound of filibustering or just outright lies in the background, that's what that sound is. Um, I'll start off with a land acknowledgement and then introduce our speakers. We have a very exciting uh, session uh, coming up here. Um, we'd like to acknowledge that the University of Alberta is located on the lands of the Treaty 6 territories. These are the traditional and ancestral territory of the Cree, the Dene, the Blackfoot, the Soto, and the Nakota Sioux. I also acknowledge that this, is territory, this territory is home to regions 2, 3, and 4 of the Métis Nation of Alberta within the historical Northwest Métis homeland, all of whose presence continues to enrich our vibrant community. A special thanks to Paladin, Astellas, and AstraZeneca for their ongoing support of the API ser ser seminar series. Uh, our session today is called Give Life Alberta, Program Inception and Future. Um, and uh, we have four speakers for you, so um, I will introduce them all up front, and then they will go in the order that they've already selected. So right off the bat, uh, we have Carrie Holiday, who is a senior donation consultant with the Alberta Organ and Tissue Donation Program. She holds a Master of Social Work from the University of Manitoba and has a Certificate in Health Law Policy and Ethics in, of AI in Healthcare from the University of Ottawa. Carrie has 10 years of experience as a clinical social worker in critical care, palliative, donation, and transplantation. She also has 10 years of hospital development experience, most recently as the project manager for the Specialist in End of Life or SEND program uh, uh, here in Alberta. Ms. Sue Lingo is the Senior Communications Advisor for the Alberta Organ and Tissue Donation Program, now known as the Alberta Organ and Tissue Donation Program. She proudly joined the team after 17 years as the award-winning health reporter at Global Edmonton, where she always felt honored to share inspirational stories of generous donor families and grateful recipients. Many of us as patients have been interviewed over the years by her as well. In her new role with AHS, Sue Ling is encouraging a culture of donation in Alberta by helping to develop and execute a rebrand of the AOTDP program, along with public awareness campaigns, a community engagement strategic plan, and public education sessions. She has a Bachelor of Science degree from the U of A and a diploma in radio and television from NAIT. Mr. Mike Bentley holds a Bachelor of Science in Medical Laboratory Science and a Master's uh, in business administration, both from the U of A. Early in his career, Mike spent several years as a clinical research coordinator in the Division of Cardiothoracic Surgery at the U University Hospital prior to joining Transplant Services in 2003. Since that time, Mike has held various management positions within the program, including all components of organ and tissue donation and transplantation. In addition to operational management, Mike has been involved in several provincial and national initiatives over the years. Over the years. In May of 2023, Mike became the inaugural program manager of the uh, Alberta Organ and Tissue Donation Program. And finally, Dr. Andreas Kramer, for many of you needs no introduction. Uh, Andreas is a clinical professor in the Department of Critical Care Medicine and Clinical Neurosciences at the University of Calgary. He completed residencies in internal medicine and critical care medicine at the University of Calgary and fellowship training in neurocritical care at the University of Virginia, where he also obtained a Master of Science degree in Health Evaluation Sciences. He has worked both as a community general internist and intensivist, as well as an academic critical care and neurocritical care physician. He has served as the medical director of the Southern Alberta Organ and Tissue Donation Program and co-lead for the Provincial Specialist in End of Life or SEND program, and was recently appointed as the medical director of the new Alberta Organ and Tissue Donation Program. I'd like to hand it over to Carrie, who I think will take us off. Thanks, Carrie. Okay, thanks. Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks, Sean, for the kind introduction. Our goal today is to provide you with a brief introduction to Give Life Alberta, which is the new name for the Alberta Organ and Tissue Donation Program. Um, we, uh, none of us have any uh, relevant conflicts of interest to report today. We're passionate about organ and tissue donation because we know about the impact that these can have. For recipients of organs and tissues, it can be life-saving and quality of life enhancing. Donors and their families find some comfort and meaning through the act of giving. And from a societal perspective, donation and transplantation are very cost-effective. The Alberta Organ and Tissue Donation Agency was established in 2013 through an amendment to the Human Tissue and Organ Donation Act with the mandate 
uh, as listed directly from the le legislation to coordinate and support the work of Alberta donation organizations, educate, educate the public and increase awareness, manage the online donation registry and monitor the system of donation. In large part because the agency was not directly embedded within the healthcare system, the only aspect of this mandate that it was really able to fulfill was to provide some support to the donation organizations and to successfully manage the registry. The Alberta Organ and Tissue Donation Registry is available at myhealth.alberta.ca and has been reasonably successful with about 870,000 Albertans registered to donate their organs and tissues at the end of life. Another amendment to legislation that came into effect just over one year ago permitted a regional health authority to carry out activities on behalf of the agency. This made it possible in the legislation for Alberta Organ and Tissue, the, the Alberta Organ and Tissue Donation Program, now Give Life Alberta, to be established within Alberta Health Services. Give Life Alberta um, has a number of uh, staff now still in the process of recruiting others. Our program manager, as you already heard, is, is Mike Bentley. We have administrative support with Rachel Wilkins, who's also part of the SEND program. Sue Ling is our communications advisor. We've, we now have three out of our four senior donation consultants, and we still need to hire a senior analyst. Give Life Alberta has a steering committee consisting of internal stakeholders within AHS and also has an advisory committee consisting of external stakeholders, including patient and family advisors, as well as representatives from advo advocacy groups and charities. The program reports to AHS leadership and ultimately to the Minister of Health. So how can Give Life Alberta be successful moving forward. Some years ago, Canadian Blood Services summarized the elements of a high performing deceased donation system. These elements are now largely in place in Alberta, and Give Life Alberta will work in the coming years on further developing and integrating them. One of the elements is ensuring appropriate legislation is in place, including provisions for mandatory referral to the organ donation organization. Within the Alberta Human Tissue and Organ Donation Act, we have mandatory referral legislation, which states that when a person dies or their death is imminent, a medical practitioner making the determination of the person's death must provide the donation organization with the necessary information. Flow charts describing clinical triggers and the process of referral to Give Life Alberta have now been widely disseminated through, throughout the Alberta healthcare system for the past year or so. The purpose here is to ensure that when eligible potential donors exist, they are consistently identified and referred. We are hopeful that this will positively influence donation rates in Alberta, particularly in parts of the healthcare system where a significant proportion of cases would otherwise be missed. Because there are far more tissue compared with organ donation opportunities that are missed in Alberta, this is probably where the potential is greatest. You can see from this slide here that beginning in the spring of 2023, when the legislation most recently, the, the most recent iteration of the legislation came into effect, there was a definite increment in referrals for tissue donation in the province, but the effect has been modest. I think an important message here is that just because legislation is introduced and supported with widespread education, it does not necessarily mean that this will immediately change behavior or that the effect will necessarily be sustained. Education and advocacy need to be an ongoing effort, and this is an important priority of the program. CBS also recommends that performance must be monitored, measured, and reviewed systematically. 
foundational to improvement is defining metrics and working towards achieving targets. One important and widely publicized, but also nuanced, nuanced metric that is, uh, is, is the, the number of donors per million population in a, pop, in a jurisdiction. We've seen a fairly dramatic rise in Alberta over the past decade, most recently in the range of about 22 donors per million in 2022 and 2023. Based on the last available national data from 2022, this was lower than the rate in British Columbia, similar to that of Ontario, and higher than all other Canadian provinces. And in fact, because of a relatively successful living donation program in Alberta, and because of challenges in BC with availability of transplant teams and utilization of organs, Alberta actually performed more kidney transplants in 2022 than any other province. Although there's lots of room for improvement, and these rates from 2021 will have been affected by the pandemic to some degree, Alberta also tends to be a leader in non-ocular tissue donation. Some provinces, including British Columbia, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, uh, actually don't have tissue banks. In contrast, our ocular donation rates, um, though again greatly reduced during the pandemic and even now not back to our pre-pandemic levels, are somewhat lower than in some other parts of the country. And this is definitely an area where improvement is needed, particularly when one considers that Alberta purchases corneas from other jurisdictions. So what's the problem with donors per million as a, as a metric? Um, this slide is meant to depict the numerous steps that are needed for a patient to become an organ donor. As a healthcare system, um, and, and this is what, what we're promoting with Give Life Alberta, we have the responsibility to ensure that when patients are eligible for donation, this is identified, patients' families are approached for consent, and when consent is provided, we provide good care to the potential organ donor and maximize the gift of donation through transplantation whenever possible. But there are other factors upstream to donor identification that can also impact the donation rate. The management of patients with severe brain injury, including initial resuscitation and care in the ICU have greatly improved over time so that more patients are surviving. And this is of course a good thing. Patients with severe traumatic brain injury and a very swollen brain, which in a previous era constituted a large proportion of deceased organ donors, will often undergo a procedure called decompressive craniectomy. And this and other interventions have resulted in a declining proportion of head trauma patients progressing to death by neurologic criteria and in turn organ donation. In contrast, for the past decade, we've had a growing drug use epidemic across Canada, which is particularly severe in British Columbia and, Al and Alberta. And this slide shows the, the proportion of organ donors across Canadian regions that died because of an overdose. And you can see that this has significantly increased over time in all jurisdictions, but uh, very much so also in Alberta. So a complementary and arguably I would say more uh, relevant metric than donors per million is the proportion of missed organ donation opportunities. And accordingly, uh, another CBS recommendation is the implementation of death audits to identify if a donation opportunity was lost and then reporting hospital performance. In Alberta, we've been auditing missed organ donation opportunities systematically among patients in ICU or emergency departments since about mid-2021. These reviews are conducted by a team of expert donation specialists. In the first two years of the program, you can see on the right here, there were almost 2,000 deaths that met inclusion criteria for review, of which about 590 were found to be eligible potential organ donors, um, including um, some that either had confirmed or probable death by neurologic criteria and some that died from death by circulatory criteria. 17% of these were missed cases, meaning that the family of the patient was never approached about the possibility of organ donation. Since initiation of this program, 
the proportion of missed organ don donation opportunities has steadily declined um, from about 25% in mid-2021 to just over 5% in the last quarter of 2023. Factors associated with a donation opportunity being missed have included death by circulatory rather than neurologic criteria, older patient age, and death in an emergency department rather than in an ICU. The proportion of patients where the donation program was appropriately contacted prior to withdrawal of life-sustaining measures, regardless of eligibility for organ donation, has almost doubled during this time frame. And um, I guess we'll see over time what the impact of legislation is uh, here, which again came into effect in April of 2023. We've partnered with the Provincial Physician Learning Program to develop quarterly feedback reports or report cards, if you will, that are shared with individual units regarding relevant donation metrics, including the ODO referral rate, uh, which is the corollary of, of missed opportunities and approach rate. We also share with them how they are doing compared with other units across the province. Auditing of tissue donation metrics is more difficult, but something that we've also started doing. Uh, to my knowledge, this is not systematically and routinely audited anywhere else in Canada. And this is really only possible because of how well integrated the healthcare uh, system in Alberta is through AHS. So we can use an AHS administrative data um, to identify all deaths in the Alberta healthcare system, then filter these using ICD-10 codes to exclude patients with contraindications to donation, um, like, uh, and these contraindications are different for tissue than organ donation. So for example, if, if a patient has, um, has uh, uh, a hematologic malignancy or certain infections, and then uh, we can use Connect Care, uh, our new clinical information system to, de to determine whether families were approached regarding tissue donation. And our, our hospital development uh, program in the coming years will use this information to help drive quality improvement. Another area that probably requires more attention in the future is organ and tissue utilization. So in 2023, there were 230 referred potential organ donors. So most of these had no overt contraindication to organ donation and the family had provided preliminary assent but fewer than half of these became actual organ donors. So there's multiple factors that go into these decisions, mostly related to donor and potential recipient characteristics, but there is some variability of practice between transplant programs and even within transplant programs in the willingness to use organs from uh, say older donors or those with more what might, what might be called marginal organs. Another CBS recommendation is to encourage the presence of highly specialized staff, um, such as donation coordinators, which of course we've had for a long time, and uh, donation physicians. Um, and the, the, the role of these individuals is in part to implement best practices, support donor uh, management, uh, improve quality, and provide education. I'm grateful that for the last three years or so, we've had funding in Alberta for what has been called the Specialist in End-of-Life Care Neuroprognostication and Donation Program. Um, there are uh, physicians that are part of this program disseminated throughout uh, the healthcare system at all hospitals in Alberta that have the ability to provide mechanical ventilation um, uh, over time. Um, and uh, th these, these physicians have been very engaged in, in advancing uh, donation practice in Alberta. CBS recommends that jurisdictions have um, efforts in place for public education and awareness, as well as implementation of leading practices and clinical practice guidelines. You're gonna be hearing more from Sue Ling about public education, um, including um, uh, an introduction to our, our new website, which uh, in some ways is still a work in progress. Um, uh, through the SEND program, there's a great deal of professional education 
occurring, including now regular uh, grand rounds uh, once every four to six weeks or so. Um, although, uh, of course, uh, a lot of the uh, donation education that needs to occur in ICUs and emergency departments happens at the bedside in our day-to-day -day care of patients. The informatics we have in Alberta through Connect Care have also made it possible to incorporate clinical practice guidelines into order sets. So, for example, when a patient in the ICU becomes an organ donor, there are provincial order sets for the care of the potential organ donor um, and similar um, standardized uh, documentation is being developed for uh, death documentation. The final CBS recommendation is that uh, the clinical donation process is supported at every step in the pathway from donor identification and referral through to transplant and post-transplant care. One of the implications of our increasing donation activity in Alberta has also been more transplants, of course, and so there's a, a ripple effect. And I think together as a community, we all need to advocate for um, resources to um, help ensure that we're providing the best care possible. So we're going to be hearing from um, Mike, Carrie, and Sue Ling about uh, Give Life Alberta strategic plan, hospital development model, advertisement campaign, public awareness, website development. Some of our other priorities in the short and medium, ter medium term is, as I mentioned, we still have some staff to hire. Um, we're excited about the implementation of iTransplant, which is the industry standard donation clinical information system in Alberta. We're working on harmonization of policies and procedures across the province, including in relation to organ donation after medical assistance and dying. And um, an important initiative given Alberta legislation and our current capabilities is the expansion of tissue uh, and especially ocular donation capacity beyond just Edmonton uh, and Calgary. I like to show this slide because it, it, I think, communicates the complexity of the processes that are involved in, in deceased, uh, in this case, organ donation. I think it's important for the uh, critical care and emergency community, and I'm part of that community, to be always mindful uh, also of um, the patients that aren't our first immediate priority, namely the uh, namely transplant patients, and similarly for our transplant colleagues to remember in their practices that um, the, the organs that are, are uh, being used for the transplants in their patients are coming from, from real patients and, and real families, and um, they should also be mindful of, of, um, of, uh, of their needs um, so that collectively we can provide great comprehensive care. Thank you, and I'll uh, turn it over to Mike at this point. Thanks, Andreas. Okay, so uh, yeah, as Andreas mentioned, I'll be uh, going over our strategic plan. We think this will give you a good insight into the work we're gonna be doing now and into the future. So I'll be going over uh, how we've developed the plan, what the high level components of it are, and uh, what our next steps will be. So, uh, so in terms of our planning roadmap, uh, we followed an iterative process. Um, we, uh, we began by establishing our vision, mission, and goals. Uh, then once those were established, we moved on to our uh, strategic objectives. And again, once those were established, we went into our specific initiatives, uh, our scorecards, and our key performance indicators. Um, at each of these stages, we engaged a number of stakeholders, both from uh, within the system and the public, uh, heavily engaged with patient and family stakeholders as well. So that included uh, SEND physicians, the advisory committee that uh, Andreas mentioned, um, the, some of the SCNs, and of course, um, uh, members of the public. So right now we're at our final approval stage. We're actually bringing this to um, our steering committee at the end of next week. So we will be able to have our first um, finalized version of our strategic plan at that point. So I won't be going through the whole thing. It is, it is obviously a complete draft, but I just wanna go through the high level components today and give, it'll give you some good insight into um, the work we're going to be doing. Um, so uh, for starters, our vision, 
Um, so just to orient us to what a vision is, is it's meant to be a compelling and concise statement of uh, future state of the jurisdiction um, in which you work. Um, so to develop our vision, we did an extensive environmental scan of Canadian and US uh, donation uh, programs just to give us an idea of what the types of things are included in a vision statement. Um, we, of course, um, engaged in the uh, st uh, stakeholder consultations that I described before. Um, so the, the, our, our attempt here with our vision is to capture um, our primary duty as a donation program is to our donors and families. But of course, we have a responsibility to transplant recipients and, um, and inclusion. So, so the current version of the vision says uh, quality care in organ and tissue donation, access to transplantation for all Albertans. So um, I think the wording needs a little bit of uh, wordsmithing still, but I think the sentiment is uh, where we want it to be. And that's, that's what our vision will look like. Our mission statement, we followed a similar process to develop it in terms of an environmental scan and um, stakeholder engagement. Um, mission statements, um, again, to orient us, are meant to be um, a statement of the core purpose of the organization and of specifically how the organization contributes to the vision. Um, we, uh, vi mission statements can be very long and descriptive, and they can also be more short and memorable. Um, there's neither right or wrong. It's just it's just a preference. So we've sort of gone with the something on the bit on the shorter side. Um, so the mission statement reads to optimize patient and family care related to organ and tissue donation, to uphold responsible stewardships stewardship of the gifts of organ and tissues, and to enhance access to transplantation. So um, a couple of things to point out. Uh, the order of the, these elements, just three key elements, uh, is intentional. While ultimately we have a responsibility to provide safe organs and tissues for our recipients, we can't subordinate the care of donors and families to that objective. So we've placed this in the order we have just to help remind us of, of our role in the system. Um, and we also wanted to acknowledge, particularly in the first element, that um, we want to provide good end of life care to everyone, not just people who go on to donation, because um, obviously that's not necessarily an option for everyone, but they do uh, are entitled to good care around that process, which may, it, you know, in many cases just means understanding why they may not be eligible to donate. So that's our mission statement. Um, our goals um, are to, we have four goals, uh, build a strong donation culture. Uh, we want to support high quality donation related patient and family care. Uh, optimize donation rates and optimize system performance. So our, our challenge with the goals, um, is we wanted to use action oriented and results oriented language, but we also have to recognize that our role in, in many aspects of the system is supportive and we're not the ones providing frontline care. So that's why you see words like support, build, optimize. Um, we wanted to strike a balance along those lines. So I'll just run through um, our goals now and the strategic objectives that, uh, that fall under them. So under building a strong donation culture, we're going to improve public awareness of organ and tissue donation, including that patients and families should expect end of life care to include the opportunity to discuss donation. Uh, we wanna build public trust in the organ and tissue donation system. We wanna ensure public education is inclusive and culturally safe. Um, we want to increase registrations in the Alberta Organ and Tissue Donation Registry, and that's actually part of our legislated mandate as well. And we want to maintain engagement with public interest groups uh, to ensure collaboration, synergy, and consistent messaging. Uh, goal number two, um, support high quality donation related patient and family care. So objectives under that are to support healthcare providers in developing and maintaining systems that optimize organ and tissue donation. Uh, we want to enhance knowledge of organ and tissue donation among healthcare professionals. Uh, we want to maintain engagement with patients and families to assess the quality of service and to inform service delivery. And uh, we want to enhance uh, inclusion and cultural safety in the delivery of care. And we want to ensure there's province wide access to donation services. Our third goal is optimizing donation rates. And to, and to some extent, all of our strategic objectives uh, will feed into optimizing donation rates. But of course, we have to organize them under one heading just for you know practical use. So, so in addition to you know many of the objectives we've talked about before, um, some other things we're going to be doing to optimize donation rates is to establish and maintain mechanisms 
to measure system performance on an ongoing basis. Um, we're going to establish internal and, um, and public reporting related to system performance, including uh, key performance indicators and targets. Again, this aligns with uh, our legislative mandate to do that. Fourth goal, um, optimize system performance. So this just is, is, is to capture our role in terms of um, leading practice and quality improvement in general. So this, these, these objectives relate to both the donation program and to the broader system. So we want to advance provincial harmonization and adapt, adoption of leading practices. Uh, we want to advocate for sufficient capacity to facilitate organ and tissue donation and transplantation as uh, donation activity increases. Uh, we want to partner with operational leadership to implement continuous quality improvement initiatives. And we want to contribute to education, research, and innovation through partnerships, participation, and in-kind contributions. So that's our uh, high-level strategic plan uh, elements. Our next steps, um, uh, as I mentioned, um, we do have a complete strategic plan. So the next level down is our SMART initiatives. And so those have been established and we'll be working off those to build action plans and move the work forward, which has already, already begun, of course. Um, as I mentioned, we are gonna finalize the approval with our steering committee next week. Um, and then it'll get into an annual cycle because of course the strategic plan is a living document. So we will get into an annual cycle of uh, updating it uh, and engaging in stakeholders again on priorities and we'll, we'll publishing a new strategic plan every year we anticipate. So with that, I will hand it over to Carrie. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. So moving on to, to talk a little more about hospital development. So hospital development has really become kind of the industry term for the non-clinical work that happens in donation. And so the hospital development team is really responsible for the donation process within hospitals. They work collaboratively with hospital leadership managers and frontline clinicians involved in donation, monitor performance, support improvement, and of course, very importantly, to celebrate successes. As Dr. Kramer mentioned, we have four senior donation consultants. Three of us are already on board and they are advanced practice positions with all of us are masters prepared that, and we have extensive experience over a number of years in, in organ and tissue donation. And the idea is that if all the work that we are doing is effective, you know, we see that increase in clinical activity, um, a lot of the quality improvement work that's happened over the years have sort of been in kind and off the side of the desks of our clinical teams. And the hope is that we see, continue to see increases in activity and that this team is able to support all of that non-clinical work that happens. Every hospital in Alberta will have a donation consultant. We're initially starting with our hospitals with organ donation potential and uh, complementing the work that's happening currently with our SEND program and our physician support of organ donation workflows and being able to put a little more emphasis on tissue donation. So the senior donation consultants are going to work specifically with each individual hospital. We are going to utilize the information from the potential donor audits that Dr. Kramer shared, as well as the tissue information to monitor activity. That way we can see specifically when we host educational activities or if we work on a quality improvement project, we're using that data to sort of guide our efforts. The hope is that working with site-specific donation resource teams, we can get a really good understanding of what's happening within a hospital, identify barriers that might be preventing donation from occurring, and then being able to share successful, um, successful activities that have worked in other sites and being able to bring that back to local sites. In addition, we hope to be able to be a little bit more proactive in terms of creating annual site-based action plans. So if we notice a specific trend in the data that we wanna address, we will make plans for the following year of how we're going to do that. The other role of the senior donation consultants is really to weave those messaging from our communications department around sharing the benefits of organ and tissue donation within our hospitals. So all of the information that Su Ling is gonna share with you you, the hope is that we can also find ways to integrate that into all of our hospitals. So donation resource teams, um, 
it, you know, it is actually a recommendation through Accreditation Canada. And it's not that we haven't had these types of committees provincially in the past. Um, we, we've always had provincial committees and oftentimes we will stand up a committee to support a certain workflow. So for instance, if we're working on a policy revision or, um, you know, a, a different activity, those have been stood up sort of, you know, for short term. And the idea is that each hospital will have that on an ongoing basis. And so we've made some recommendations for who we feel would be uh, helpful in having in those types of committees. But most importantly, we're gonna work with the site specifically. And if we identify opportunities for improvement or, you know, we allow the committee to identify the people within the site can, that can help support this work. In terms of our implementation timeline, we've actually started engaging with site leadership several months ago to start to talk about the work of hospital development and invite them to initiate donation resource teams. We've had really, really good support and buy-in from those meetings thus far. And then the hope is that collectively we look at some of the data and the metrics in conjunction with our donor coordinators, our SEND physicians and our programs to, you know, eventually get to the point where all of those activities that I mentioned will be actualized. You know, we are, of course, competing with other healthcare priorities, but the benefit of having a dedicated non-clinical team is that, you know, we can ask for direction from the site, but we now have a little bit more of the staff to do the legwork on, you know, whatever resources might be, might be needed. All right, and thank you. I'm just going to hand that over to Sue Ling to talk to you more about the communications. Hi, hopefully everyone can hear me. Um, I'm going to talk about our branding and public awareness today. And Oh, there we go. All right, so um, as we've heard, the Alberta Organ and Tissue Donation Program was officially formed about a year ago, and that combined uh, five healthcare teams in Calgary and Edmonton. Um, and so right away, as far as communications goes, um, they knew that we would need a new name and a new logo. Um, Alberta Organ and Tissue Donation Program, doesn't exactly roll off the tongue, neither does uh, the acronym AOTDP. So they wanted to simplify that to be able to um, get the message out to the public a little better. We knew that we would need a new user-friendly web page on our AHS website. The ex existing one is a wealth of information, but it's, it's a little hard to navigate. And uh, we knew that we would need a provincial public education campaign. So I am the lucky person who gets to kind of um, take on all of these goals. Uh, so right away, we knew we'd have to find a marketing partner. Um, so from October to December last year, we had a directed request for proposals and three companies submitted. We ended up selecting ZGM Modern Marketing Partners because of their experience with sensitive health topics. Um, they've done campaigns on uh, COVID-19, uh, STIs, FASD, so things that, you know, subjects that are pretty tough to take on. They'd also done uh, an Indigenous-focused version of their uh, COVID-19 campaign, which we knew would come in um, pretty handy and it would be excellent experience for us to have as we sort of expand our campaign down the road. Oh, there we go. Sorry, a little slow. Um, so ZGM had to do a, its learning phase. There was a lot to learn about this, this field. So in January, they conducted an environmental scan of national and international programs. So they looked at, you know, how were they promoting organ and tissue donation across Canada? They looked at the US, the UK, um, Australia, just to see what kind of campaigns they were doing, what kind of messages they were sending. Um, and then they also did uh, some staff engagement. So they looked at um, Alberta Organ and Tissue Donation Program staff, physicians, partners, ATI was part of this. We're so grateful for that. Um, so they did nine virtual sessions. That was with 27 staff and a survey with 73 respondents. 
Um, and they were just trying to find out, you know, what they thought would be the most important messages to send to the public. What are some misconceptions? Um, you know, what do, what do people need to know? So here were the key findings. Um, first off, we found out that most Albertans support organ and tissue donation. I think, I think we probably already knew that. That's kind of intuitive, but the numbers vary. Um, some, you know, above 90%. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think Albertans especially are aware of this partly because of the Boulay family and the, the Logan Boulay effect. Um, I think that had a big impact on Albertans. Um, a 2023 Canadian Blood Services and Ipsos survey found that 44% of Albertans believe the method of officially expressing intent to donate was by signing their donor card, which we know is out of date information. 3% knew it was by telling their family, but 41% did not know. So most Albertans don't know they need to register their decision to donate on the online Alberta Health Registry or in a motor vehicle registry office, and that their family will have the final say. So AHS uh, donor coordinators said, I'm not sure if it was the main reason, could be one of the main reasons, I need to clarify that, that a patient eligible for organ and tissue donation does not go on to donate is because their family declines. And we heard from Dr. Kramer about how hard it is and all the steps that have to go into identifying a patient who is eligible. So a lot goes on to, you know, goes into that before a family is even approached. And then, you know, a family declines, um, which is, their choice, of course, um, but through education and, and inform, you know, information, we're hoping to get more families to consent there. Uh, so our ultimate goal is a culture of donation in Alberta. So through education, as I mentioned, we hope to increase both registration and consent rates. We want donation decisions and family conversations ahead of time, not at that time of extreme grief. And of course, we want no stigma about donors or recipients. So it's all about normalization. Just, you know, organ and tissue donation is just part of end of life care. So I'll tell you about our new name. You already know it. It is Give Life Alberta. So ZGM narrowed down, I think they gave us, I think it was a choice of eight names. We narrowed it down to five. So the finalists were Organ and Tissue Alberta, Alberta Donation Network, Donate slash Transplant Alberta, Vital Donations Alberta, and Give Life Alberta. And in February, AOTDP and AHS community, uh, community Engagement, we partnered to survey staff, physicians, donor families, recipients, and advocates, some of you as well. Thank you so much for, for taking part in that. That was across Alberta, so we had 131 respondents. And the clear favorite by a landslide was Give Life Alberta, which many felt was a call to action. And a couple of people did point out that Vital Donations Alberta did what the acronym was VD. So that, that one was not ideal. So I'm really, really glad that we went with uh, Give Life Alberta, and I hope you are too. So our new logo, I think you saw that um, in Carrie's presentation, it is the dotted heart. Um, ZGM described it as iconic, clear, practical, modern, timeless. And the idea is that the green heart fills the void of the dotted heart. So it is a symbol of the gift of life. And here's how some potential merchandise could look. We have actually ordered some t-shirts um, they're not quite like this, but it should be really nice. And we've ordered some bags. I like the pin. I hope we can eventually order that, Mike. Uh, our new web page. So the URL is givelifealberta.ca, and that directs you to a specific page uh, within the AHS website. You can see our logo there. Um, the register or update your decision, that green button there, that shows up a few times on our page so that as people sort of scroll down, there's a number of opportunities for them to click on that and register their decision. Uh, I should mention that this is a work in progress. So what you're about to see is just sort of the bare bones basic information that we want the public to know, but everything that's on the current um, organ and tissue donation page on the AHS website 
Um, a lot of that will be incorporated into this page eventually. This is just sort of where we're starting. So we have our facts section with, um, you know, some did you knows, um, one organ donor can save up to eight lives, just really easy, simple to read, um, not too overwhelming for people when they open this up. Uh, I like this part. This is our interactive anatomy section. So if you hover over each of these icons, it'll tell you. So for example, over if you hover over heart, it'll say if if you donate your heart, here's how you know you can help someone with severe heart disease or you know the the pancreas or you know if you hover over each of these, it'll it'll show you. I wish I could show you, but we didn't want to crash this presentation today by going to the actual website. But I hope you can check it out yourselves. Uh, we do have a section on living donors, and if you click on that, it'll take you to more information. Frequently asked questions. So this is our myth busting section. Um, so for, for example, a lot of people think they're too old or too unhealthy to donate, um, and that's not necessarily the case. So if you click on that underneath, it says, you know, don't count yourself out. Um, you know, let the professionals decide if, if you know, if you are too, too old or too unhealthy. Um, so, yeah, we thought this was a really important message for the, the public as well. A lot of myths out there. We have some donor and recipient stories on our website, some videos, and we'll be adding a lot more. We're working on some right now. And of course, we have our, our organ and tissue donation events. Of course, we have to have a section for a green shirt day. Um, dedicated to Logan Boulay, and then we have um, NOTA, National Organ and Tissue Donation Awareness Week. And then about us, about Give Life Alberta, is our contact information. So that's our website. Okay, now here is our sneak peek. I know you've been waiting for this. This is our new public awareness campaign. It will not be revealed fully until April 22nd, but um, you lucky folks are... <laughs> getting a little, a little peek today. And I'll kind of walk you through how we got there. So as I mentioned, we want to encourage a culture of donation. And um, we all thought, along with the marketing company, we all thought that because organ and tissue donation is so emotional, obviously, we would need sort of this epic tear jerking campaign to kind of inspire people to donate. But then once we started to do all that research, we realized that most Albertans already support donations. So we don't, we don't necessarily have to inspire most Albertans. We could easily reach most Albertans, um, but they don't know that they need to register and that their family will have the final say. So for this particular campaign, we decided that the conversation part of this was more important than the registration part of this. Because as we've heard from our donor coordinators and from our donor families, knowing what loved ones want uh, makes it much easier to give consent. You know, if that awful, you know, traumatic time ever comes, at least it does make it a little easier if they knew what they wanted. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let's have a sip from my ATI mug here. <laughs> Thank you, Sean. Okay. Yeah, Sean, I had to give that mug a little plug. Um, okay, so the, the campaign is called All the Ways. Um, it normalizes conversations about end of life. That's our goal. We want people to just talk about organ and tissue donation. It doesn't have to be grim. It can just sort of be matter of fact. It could even be a light, a lighthearted conversation. It is possible. So we did go with a little bit of tongue in cheek humor, which as I mentioned, we never would have expected to do this when we started out. So it does have a lighthearted tone. And we feel that it diffuses the emotion of this um, and it will catch people's attention and it will make the ads memorable. So all the ways, a cake. Here is um, one of the images. This is, this is a mock-up actually. This isn't the exact image that will be used. Um, but the tagline is, however you tell them, your family needs to know. So for example, Here's a cake that says, I'm an organ and tissue donor from mom. And these are sort of 
over the top sort of tongue in cheek, you know, ways that you could tell your family or your loved ones about this. Uh, you could have a needlepoint that says live, love and donate my organs. Uh, you could have a card with a poem that says roses are red, organs are too, donate mine when my time here is through. You could have a fancy tattoo like this one, or you could have a shirt that says when I die, donate everything under this shirt. So as I mentioned, um, the ads are all about just catching people's attention, getting them talking. Did you know that your family needs to know if you want to be a donor? Um, and we hope that people might come up with their own creative ways to share the news with their family. We did, of course, uh, share this campaign um, with or some of the campaign ideas with our, our donor families. We spoke with a number of them. They did support normalizing family discussions, agreed that they don't need to be grim. They support encouraging Albertans to share donation decisions in a simple way, again, doesn't need to be a complicated, grim, sit down, okay, family, listen up, we need to have this conversation. And our donor family supported the use of humor to grab attention and to make these ads memorable. And I can tell you that um, it's already getting media attention. We've already booked a couple of interviews for um, Not Awe, which is the week of April 22nd. So you'll be hearing a lot more about this. Um, after it launches. Um, and the future of, oh, I should also mention going back, um, we will have commercials as well. We'll have videos um, to share that week as well. We have three sort of lighthearted, um, really creative um, commercials that will come out. And uh, I hope you really like everything. So we'll be sharing a lot more with you then. All right, the future of um, Give Life Alberta in terms of communications, our next steps is we definitely want more campaigns in more languages. We want to target various audiences, including people who don't actually support organ and tissue donation. That's, that, it, that is our goal down the line to try to reach out to them. Um, we want more education in schools, of course, and I know that the Boulay family has been a huge, you know, huge advocates for education in schools, so um, trying to work with them, of course, and support them in that initiative. And uh, we want more education for motor vehicle registry employees, which I think is a great way to uh, reach the average Albertan. So again, uh, we're looking for a culture of donation. And um, that's our ultimate goal. So thank you so much for um, listening to our presentation today. Thank you so much, Ling, Mike, Carrie, and Andreas. That was absolutely fantastic. I have to say I am blown away. I was watching the numbers of attendees um, climbing and climbing, and we were just shy of 100 there, which is the highest I've ever seen in the year that I've been here with the ATI. So um, congratulations. That was all tremendous work. Um, I was also looking at names that were going by. I saw donor family name and transplant Jason there. I see my buddy Everett um, from CBS Ottawa team, uh, who is also proving that I'm not the only weirdo who has a transplant and works in this field. Um, he is a heart transplant recipient as well. So good to see and Nancy Fleming, good to see you here too. Um, we have lots of questions starting to accumulate in the chat, but please also use the raise hand function uh, in Zoom. And do you want to ask your questions out loud? Uh, I think it's a great one. And I was happy to see it was on the website as a starting point uh, in doing presentation. Yeah, <laughs> thanks so much. That was so great. I'm so excited for what happened next. And I think this looks really incredible. Um, you did touch on living donation, um, uh, Suling, in your uh, component of the presentations here today. But uh, and maybe it was just that the focus today was more on um, deceased donation and, and the metrics around that. But you know, living donation is obviously a big part of, of that, too. And I'm just curious maybe a question for Andreas and Mike about, you know, the strategic plan and how that, um, what, the, what the living donor sort of components of that would be. Thank you. I can take that, Andreas, if, yeah, okay. Yeah, good question, Anne. So, um, and I'll try to give a quick answer because I know we're running low on time. Um, so yes, living donation is within the scope of our work and the strategic plan. Um, I think the tri it's tricky because living donation is a lot different than deceased donation in practice. And so the actual clinical delivery of that service 
um, is just completely different thing, right? So that's the, it, it's getting into a different area. Um, and of course the SCN does a lot of work in this realm too. So I think um, we need to work on that with the living donor programs and what that looks like. I think, for example, there's definitely a role as you saw it's on our website, there's a role in public awareness for us, um, a, a role in monitoring uh, performance um, and reporting. But then when you get into the actual like quality improvement and leading practice, then it becomes a little more complicated. So we're leaving the we're leaving the door open for that for sure. And that's sort of our next step. I'm actually meeting with Jen Crisdale next week to start talking a little bit about this. Okay. Um, and of course, I report to Deanna. So I talk to her all the time. But we're going to flesh that out. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, because anon anonymous donors are very different than related donors or or connected donors. And, you know, I yeah. think anonymous donors is a huge area to tackle because anyone can do that. It's more maybe similar to deceased oh, donation sorry, in some yeah, ways. Yeah. So I'm happy to just ever talk about that I anytime like, if you would like. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Anne. Uh, Patricia, I know I had a question in the chat as well uh, around the research and where it may fit in the strategic the strategic plan. Um, I know Andreas is spending part of his vacation working on a proposal with us, so uh, um, that's fantastic. But uh, when can we see a day when uh, 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 a Give Life Alberta shirt is also sipping the eight from an API mug at the same time? <laughs> um, maybe I'll just maybe I'll just weigh in on the the research question. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I think I see that being the answer to that being one of partnership. Um, ATI and CDTRP have obviously expertise and resources that Give Life Alberta doesn't. They're primarily uh, research groups um, with expertise in methodology and with expertise in securing funding which isn't really the main mandate of Give Life Alberta, but what Give Life Alberta can provide is, is um, uh, access to data, um, access to expertise. Obviously there's lots of people within Give Life Alberta, not just with our main staff, but, but just our community of, of SEND physicians and donor coordinators and others um, that, uh, that, 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 that can partner with interested researchers within a ATI and CDTRP. So a, a good example of this, I think, coming to fruition is, is just what Sean, I think, was alluding to, which is re recently there was a, a publication about um, research priorities within ATI, and, and uh, I'm grateful that um, uh, research and organ donation was part of that, that initiative. And I guess um, this was, has been of some interest and, and uh, particularly related to um, consent and, and why families do or don't give give consent for organ donation. And so this is a good opportunity of where such a partnership can can work really well, I think. Fantastic. I apologize to everyone for the sound all around me. I'm in a hotel lobby in Ottawa, so um, we'll meet me as soon as I stop talking. Uh, Cassandra, do you want to ask your questions uh, out loud? I think you have a, a, a great series of them there. Sure. Thanks, Sean. Um, so wonderful presentation, wonderful work team. Thank you so much. Um, it's wonderful to see a decline in these missed donation opportunities that the SEND program has started, initiated. Um, will this organization have influence on increasing like organ, tissue, islets, social work coordinators, um, HLA techs, et cetera, et cetera, to help achieve your goals? Um, obviously, increasing essential staff will help to facilitate donor families' care and employee wellness. I can take that, Andreas, as well. So um, so yes, um, right now, um, work has, uh, has been done for a while, sort of at the director level to identify the resource requirements that the system is going to need to accommodate the increase in activity, both in donation and transplantation. Um, so that, that is being looked at and we help with that work. Obviously, um, that is an executive level decision in terms of allocating funding, but we, uh, work with the operational programs to help move that forward. Great. Uh, I see we're nearing the top of the hour, but I'll try to get through as many of these as we can quickly. Uh, from Linda, this is a very timely one because we've had seminars recently um, on caregivers, um, but uh, will there be any added in or enhanced support for donor families uh, during both the end of life period and post donation?
I, I so Linda, we we don't have funding specifically to hire personnel uh, like that, but uh, of course that there there such resources uh, already exist within our emergency departments and critical care units, and so I think I think it's more an issue of collaborating to ensure that those uh, needs can be met. And um, so I, I don't know if, if Carrie, if you want to weigh in on this at all, I, I, I do see the role of the senior donor donation consultants being in part to collaborate with frontline care providers to, um, to, to help um, ensure that, 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 that those needs are addressed as well as we can, as well as with donor coordinators. I mean, definitely in terms of continuing to do education and outreach, different groups, the hospital development staff are going to be able to, to build on that. And, you know, uh, currently our, our donor coordinators have pretty robust donor family follow-up and aftercare. And so we're looking at sort of that complementary relationship between the hospital staff and the donor coordinators to continue to build on, on supporting our donor families. Great, we're at the Thank top you. of the hour, and I and I will uh, keep the lines open. I don't know how long our speakers can stay with us, but uh, actually, a side question: Given we're seven, eight questions down uh, from where we're, we're going to get to, Ling, is there any kind of a social media presence where people can start to feed these questions uh, under Give Like Alberta in the future? Uh, we won't have our own social media channels. We're using the existing AHS channels. We just thought that was the best use since they already have, you know, a lot of followers. And, Communication people. Um, but yeah, we'll, I mean, we will be, of course, sharing a lot on those channels. Okay, great. Uh, Dr. Shojai, do you want to ask your question uh, out loud? So you had uh, one about budget and another one around evidence surrounding public awareness campaigns in general. Sure, I can do that. Thank you very much for presentation. It's a very exciting initiative. I have two quick questions. One is, if it's not a confidential thing, can I ask what's our budget for this organization and initiative? And I'm interested to compare that with Trillium, Trillium Gift of Life budget and, and the BC budget. And the second question I had was, is there any scientific evidence that a public campaign can sustainably increase organ donation because these are very expensive campaigns and uh you know i i'm just thinking you know if if there is no evidence or if evidence against that then we might need to perhaps think twice spending our limited budget so maybe i'll talk about the money and i'll let andreas talk about the science um so yeah uh, funding questions are tricky uh ahs wants to be transparent with this sort of information but uh, at my level, I'm not authorized to sort of divulge that. There's a different process for requesting that. But what I will disclose at, uh, uh, at risk of doing something I'm not supposed to is that our annual budget for um, public awareness, I think is the, your question, um, not including salaries, but just for materials and execution is in the five to $600,000 a year range. That's what we've been budgeted for public awareness on an ongoing basis. Um, and I think I'll deflect the science question to Andreas. Yeah, I I, I won't profess to be um, uh, entirely familiar with with uh, what's all out there. Whatever is is going to be low quality uh, evidence. Obviously, it's going to be observational in in nature largely. Um, and then I think you have to ask, well, what, what is the outcome you're, you're interested in? You know, our, our initial blitz that Su Ling was referring to is not, you know, as ambitious as saying that uh, public awareness campaigns will change the number of donors per million uh, population that you have. That seems rather um, lofty and far-fetched, particularly in a, in a short period of time. Um, but one very objective parameter that we can look at is, is whether it increases registrations. You know, and and that's really the target of of the the initial advertising blitz. Um, uh, I think it will be very measurable uh, because that's a, a an easy uh, outcome to uh, to 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 track. Um, I, I you know um, I I think what our annual budget for that will will be in the future I think remains to. Um, to uh, be seen to some some degree, you know, we're in the early days here, and I think budgets are going to be um, 
somewhat pliable, I think, over over uh, over time. Um, there's obviously only so much we can do with our public awareness. You know, I saw a question about school presentations, for for example, in there in there too. And so it's a great question. I, I I'm not really I'm giving you more thoughts rather than a, a good answer. Thank you so much. Yeah, school presentations is a fantastic topic after Green Shirt Day because many of us know Bernie Boulay herself is a school teacher and has been integrating the organized campaign for the Canadian Blood Services uh, into her class curriculum on some of the areas where some flexibility is permitted. So uh, well, there's opportunities uh, there for sure, and especially when it's decreasing for the culture. Thank you. It's fantastic. A lot of the other comments that are stand through are really just huge congratulations and a massive thank you to everybody. Uh, especially with our four speakers. Um, I just want to uh, invite you all to join us next week for a virtual seminar as we host Dr. Feisel. The title of this talk is Towards Improved Outcomes of Allogenic HCT3 Models of Precision Medicine. Uh, the, uh, the link is already in the chat up above, and I think it's quite a might put it in again. But uh, yeah, please give a warm uh, round of applause virtually to our speakers, and thank you so much. Um, and watch for, for more communications about uh, getting your shirts and your your hats and whatever else uh, Thuling uh, has, has to, to uh, sell us. So congratulations.